Good evening, adventurers, and welcome to another installment in the Legend of Kilimanjaro series. Um, today we are doing another recap video. Um, got another game going, and um, this is the recap for session six. Um, sort of a brew stock wrap up and travel to Steelboro, uh, because the party has a contract ongoing to get to Steelboro and deal with the problem. Um, that problem is going to come up in the next session. I sincerely hope. But we shall see again if you're DM. You know, your party likes to drag things out. So, we shall see. But I would love for that to happen in the next session. I've been sitting on this for fucking ages. <laughs> I'm really excited for the party to see this and get into it. But we'll see. Sorry, Mr. Mike. So, starting off, um, we had another new player join us. Um, Broccoli, the Warforged Bard. Warforged? War? Broccoli, the War Forged Bard. I don't add a face, so that's going to stay in because why not? Um, yes, War Forged. Um, in Kalamantura, the War Forged, uh, there's very, very few of them. They're very, very recent as well. Um, as I talked about in a, I think, War or a recent, another, a previous video, um, was after there was, there was, there's a war between Council of Ventura and Saladin Dynasty. After that war, during the peace, the dynasty and the council agreed to come together to share technologies, magics, and research to try and rebuild and make amends. The Warforged were created during that as a sort of collaboration between the two factions with a little bit of help from the Republic as well. Some very brilliant minds involved in that too. Um, the Warforged were created from that. That's how they exist in my world. Uh, again, there's very, very few of them, I think. I think I've spoken with Broccoli on this. I think there's maybe only 10? Maybe? I can't remember, but there's very, very few of them. Um, Broccoli wasn't his original name. I can't remember if we just... I can't remember what the the original name for the, the Warforged was. But he was known... One of his original designations, or names, was Bob's. Standing for Built of Beach and Steel, B-O-B-S, Bob's. Um, that was his original, one of his original names. Um, and he got the name Broccoli from like his creators, the ones who built him. We're sitting down for a meal one day and he came over and said, oh, what is this? Oh, this is food. And he just took someone and tried to eat it, which his creators found hilarious. So they nicknamed him Broccoli. Uh, broccoli, Brock, Bob's, these are a couple of names, but that's what he's now known as. Uh, so he joined the party. Unfortunately, work gets in the way yet again, and a Bjorn was, un was unable to join us this session. So we we'll better catch me and him. I've uh, sent him a couple of messages, and we'll get a bit of a sit down at some point and get his thoughts on some, some Steelboro, some Brewstock wrap up stuff um maybe do it at the start of the next session or some point between i don't know but we'll get that sorted out um i do like to get my players you know involved um but during the part of the wrap-up was a farewell to mr neb uh you will be missed i don't know if you watch these videos or not but thomas we miss you and you're always welcome back he'll make it a nice eight players for me to manage which is a Someone who's only been playing D and D for a year—that's kind of intimidating. But hey ho, here we go. So, yeah, had a bit of a discussion with Mister Ned Player Thomas, and came up with a story that the two that Mister Ned and Bjorn uh, stayed to help a bit in the town, uh, Brewstock, while the others went off and dealt with the Mill Cave. And while they were helping out, Mister um, Ned was entertaining some children and. You know, just going around to generally helping out, cleaning up as best they can, and found out that there was a family whose father had been kidnapped during the Null attack. He was a very skilled smith. He was, he was, he was effectively one of the town blacksmiths, or if not the blacksmith in town. So the Null said, oh, you'll be useful, kidnapped him. And Mr. Neb decided that when he spoke to the, not widow, the mother, the widow would have liked what the husband said, um, but the recently single mother, uh, single parent, that said, no, I'll stay behind and stand in for him, if you will. 
I'll try and look after you, look after the kid, you know, help you guys try to live a normal life. So that's Mr. Neb out of the picture for now. Um, and if he ever does come back, if it's if I have quests, I have a quest to get him back into it if he ever does show up again. Um, to get the um to get the father back. So that's nice the nice little feature point to bring him back in if he does come back in at some point. If not, that's fine. But we shall see. So farewell to Mr. Neb. And after several sessions of having a coded letter, I think four sessions? Four sessions, I believe, says. So. I think it was session two, this is the letter was picked up. It was a coded letter was picked up. Finally, that was session six. With a code book being acquired in previous the previous session, the party was able to decode it. Or at least partially. Because the code book had been recovered from a bonfire, so it was quite badly damaged. Um, and attempts to mend the book. Um, mended the book, but the text on the pages were removed slightly. So the party could repair the book further, but it would remove more and more of the text in the book, ultimately making it useless for decoding. However, the book was very fragile and had been damaged in the fire, so the act of flicking through the book to do decoding was damaging the book further. So the party had one shot at this. Thankfully, um, well, so we had an attempt with Bjorn and Soraya to sit down and decode it. Now, I said Bjorn wasn't there, so, well, I rolled for him and rolled a natural 20. <laughs> Straight intelligence check. Uh, natural 20, I think 22 was his roll. Plus the intelligence. And, if, oh, okay, though they're going to learn a lot from this letter. Oh, no, natural one. <laughs> so, natural 20, natural one. I was like, that's a very balanced intelligence check, I feel. Two party skill checks. That's a very balanced start to it. Not 20, not one. So the party were able to learn a bit from the letter. Um, there were there was talk of Brewstock and the attack and the reason for the act being to steal magical items and uh, words and phrases that communicated this message. They didn't get these entire sentences. They got words and phrases that they were able to pick out and piece together that, oh, that's what this means. Um, the name Mayhew came up uh, along with blackmail, kidnap, uh, leverage, that sort of a thing. Because the Mayhew family have political ambitions. They're a middle class, upper middle class family. They want to break into nobility. And therefore ultimately end up in the council and in positions of leadership. So their daughter being kidnapped was a sort of, well, we have your daughter, you go ahead. You know, blackmail, leverage, that type of thing. And they also heard about the Defiant and the council. Now, the Defiant are effectively an evil cult that exists in Mentura. They're a cult of scourge, effectively scourge worshippers at a very simple level. But they believe that history is written by the victor. Um, and that all the pure ones did was win the, the war. So, well, they're kind of like, so, well, no, we just worship the gods, all of them. We don't care that it's... We don't care. That this, we don't care for the scourge and the pure ones. So they're effectively a bunch of scourge worshiping. They're a bunch of a bunch of scourge worshippers. That's what they do. And Achilles, his backstory ties into them, or rather, his backstory informs the plot, <laughs> as is the way of things. Uh, Achilles, his backstory is that um, rogue raised in an orphanage, formed a very strong lot of a lot of very strong bonds of friendship with other orphans and everything else uh so with that being to think they banded together and formed a group i believe called the found achilles can correct me on this one uh i believe it was the name and they set out to they were raised in the orphanage to worship the pure ones and they were their particular method of worship was very practical so achilles was raised to use the blade and the blade and his expression of the blade is a form of prayer so that's what he meant about a very practical worship so Achilles is a very practiced swordsman and him and the other orphans use their talents to hunt down and kill members of the defiant um, unfortunately this had the side effect that uh, Achilles' childhood friend Karen was killed during a fight with the defiant um, after which Achilles sort of put down his armor for a while 
Return of the Orphan Age helped raise future generations and train them in, in the practical prayers. Um, but recently was called back into the fray. Uh, whispers of the Defiant and the resurgence drew him back out again. And descriptions of a man in a letter found in the Null Cave. Descriptions of a, tear, of a crimson teardrop being the symbol of the Defiant. Um, they're trying to they're trying to keep themselves quite circularly, but their their identifier you got either a pin, a pendant, or some sort of symbol on your person is the crimson teardrop, and other members know that you are a member of the Defiant. Or if you hunt the Defiant, you know that you know these are members. That's how they keep track of each other. Um, and then we had some loot splitting. Um, the party got a lot of coin, found a lot of coin in the Null Cave, and a lot of loot. Um. At time of recording, the party haven't um, haven't well. A few people have picked a few items out, but no one has says I want this, this, this. No one has come to me with the list and said this is what I want. Um, I think I'll, I'll say this at some point. I'll they'll they'll come to it at some point, tell me what they want, and the rest is going to go to the town. And they had a lot of coin that they could put into party funds or whatever. But again, I told them, I'm running the world. I'm the dungeon master. <laughs> you guys can manage your own accounts. Apologies, Mister Mike. So. That's to be decided. Um, the next day, uh, they met up with Thrum, the Loxodon merchant from the dynasty. Uh, he was travelling to Steelborough with his entourage, Flesh, Blood, Professor Theseus, and Nadia, or Araya, I can't remember. I, I've, I've given her a couple of names, so Nadia, Araya, one of some of those. They were already travelling to Steelborough, and the party just happened to go, oh, we're heading that way anyway, we'll give you a lift. Um... On their Archean chariot. It was about to be a massive box lorry. Um, that was steam powered. And used Archean, used Archean magic as a heat source to power the boiler and everything else. So that's my introduction of the steam power. The, the possible the technology that exists in Kilimanjaro. These massive steam powered Archean wagons. Quite impressive. Massive as well. Um, so a few days of travel, uneventful, safe, um, during which time we had a bit of party bonding occurred. Some of the play by players made me think of a card game on the spot, <laughs> Three Dragon Ante, which is an actual game. So I was like, oh god, how do I play this? Um, so just quickly came up with, okay, roll 3d20, roll one, make a bet, roll two, make another bet, roll three, make another bet. Kind of like poker. Effectively, but with D20s and dice and fantasy money. But yeah. So I had to come up with that on the spot. And then Tadis, our Rune Knight fighter, had his wrestling match with Flesh and Blood, the Orc and Minotaur bodyguards for Thrun. Um uses Hill Rune to swell to a massive size and had a like a sort of sumo portal rules, as he called it, but like a sort of sumo rat. Uh, sumo wrestling match uh, which Titus won won against Flish the Orc lost against Blood the Minotaur and also lost against Achilles the um, his rogue companion who through some incredibly high acrobatics roles just was able to dodge around him and dance around him and use Titus' massive size against him and just punt him out of the ring <laughs> which is very entertaining to play to be involved as a DM, just to make up stats on the spot for an NPC, like, okay, these are big guys, let's give them very high athletics, and just hopefully they roll well. <laughs> so, yeah. And then, to see the players just chat and bond and try to get to know each other, that's very, very, very satisfying, fulfilling, um, especially with Lorilla, uh, because... Me and Lorilla's player, Nick, have uh, been talking and he said he wanted some more detail on visions. That was Lorilla's backstory. She received a vision from her god, Toromir, to set forth from the grove that, which, that she protected out into the world because there's some really evil shit coming and I need you to go get involved with this. So while the party travelled, Lorilla opened up about this and spoke to Achilles and the rest of the party saying that I've had visions. I think this is what we're brought together. So, so we've been, we haven't just been 
brought into this randomly fate chance this isn't some coincidence there's some evil shit coming there's some really dark things ahead of us and it starts at Steelboro. that's where we're heading i've had visions on this and i thought i should let you guys know which is a dn i just sat there in the chair just like i love this this is mm, beautiful just when the backstory comes out it makes the party gel Really, really enjoyed that. Really, really, really enjoyed that moment. So the wrestling match, the bit of backstory, bonding, swapping stories. We get to know each other. And then on the final day of travel, the party, uh, the, 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 car, the, the, the caravan they were on um, broke out of the woods that they've been traveling through for a number of days because that region of the tour is very heavily wooded. And they came across the sort of the central plains and in the di- not on the horizon, but in the distance, the sort of ne- middle near distance, uh, they could see a, the massive mountain range that dominates the center of Ventura, which I dubbed the spine because that's the first thing that popped to mind. Not at all a Christopher Pellini fan. Shut up. Uh, so the, the the spine mountains, and atop the spine mountains, sort of right in the center, quite biblical looking. Um, this were able to see Ventura in the distance. Um, they couldn't see the city itself, but they could see just this like beautiful, like glistening skyline, just rainbows and just thousands and thousands of sun being scattered. Thousands and thousands of, of beams of sunlight being scattered off steam glass windows and polished domes and roofs of the temples and the council, uh, the council chambers that are there so that was a oh there's a really big city up ahead and it's beautiful so the party's gonna get there in a couple of sessions but it's in the distance like oh there's Ventura little teaser <laughs> dangling in front of you I'm now turning this way turn this way for the plot <laughs> and and a bit more travel got to Steelboro and Steelboro the dwarven mining colony mining colony built into the foothills of the spine mountain range uh it's it's built in between like two toes so the mountains sort of come down like this sort of come from mountains into the foothills and come down into the plains well there's two they're like a series of um protrusions they could come like this and one comes down but there's another one behind it and another one behind it it's like a, it's like a splayed fingers or toes if you will so the road travels around Party came around. Oh god! Oh, we're at the end of the mountain range. There's another one. Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. Oh, there's another one. That kind of a thing. Um, as they rounded one of these, they could see in the distance. Oh, there's another. There's another protrusion or toe. Um, and then when they looked to the left, they see this massive, massive, imposing, very heavily defended stone wall that sort of bridges the gap between the two of these toes. Um, kind of Helm's Deepish. Um, is the vibe visual i have in my head only bigger and more impressive um helm's deep in location it's built in that sort of uh in between the mountains it's sort of there um but minas tirith ish it is covered in artillery there's ballistic cannons all sorts all over the walls this place is a fortress i'm built into the mountains um so the party rounded saw this and we're like oh hello that looks intimidating it's just walls and ballistic and everything else. And is that everything? That is every, that's all my notes. So yeah, that's everything uh, that happened in session six. So session seven is going to be Bjorn getting caught up and having him have a little, get, having him letting him have his chance to say his goodbyes to Steelboro. Because he had a thing, he had, a, he had some conversations with Francis, uh, wizard servant of the Mayhew family. So I'll let him get a chance to actually properly sit down and role play those encounters. And I'll be getting to Steelboro proper. Um, and once the party get into Steelboro proper um, and actually get in and explore, then I'll do another video about that, about Steelboro, its history and what it does, what comes out of there. Um, I've thrown the notes, I've made some notes for myself for the party, but I want the party to get there. And experience it first, then I'll put a video out on what makes up Steelborough. I think I'll do that going forward. I'll 
when a party get to a city or a town or a significant location, they'll experience it first. And then I'll come and do a video for you guys. Sort of more for kind of for the party for have a record, but also just for anyone who watches these to go, oh, so that's where they are. So they went to here, to here, to just to give a bit more life and body to the world. But that's everything, I believe. Um, if I've forgotten anything, the party will remind me, of course. But I believe that's everything. So thanks for taking with me, adventures, and until next time.